Okay, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Nasser Abu Rahmi. I'm the faculty fellow here at the Kevorkin Center. I want to just start by uh, welcoming everyone to this, our sixth, I think, event in the global series Uprising titled Dispossession, Extraction, Plunder. Um, uh, it's, we're very grateful to have you all with us today. And I'm, I'm especially grateful, I have to say, to see so many people returning to these sessions, right? And that's that's really great. And and we appreciate it. And I think it goes to what we're trying to do here in terms of building something that's a little bit cumulative and ongoing. Um, so I'm going to say a very brief word about the series and about the event, and then a briefer word about format, and then very brief, super brief uh, intros, and we can and we can get into it. Um, so Global Uprising is a year-long series this semester and next that really revolves around one central question. And that is how do we think or rethink collective action from our present, right? Um, that is if we take the last decade or so as this sort of open time of generalized insurgency, um, how do we rethink the content of uprising? What do uprisings do today? And to that end, we've taken as launching points the anti-racist uh, and anti-police uprisings in this country and the upcoming 10th anniversary of the Arab revolts. So this uh, event titled, like I said, Dispossession, Extraction, Plunder, has asked our panelists to respond to a broad set of questions about what the place of dispossession in contemporary uprising is, right? Um, that is, to think about not just spiraling inequality, which everyone sort of agrees is at the heart of contemporary protest, mo protest movements, but really what is the place of the kind of deepening, intensifying um, forms of extraction and plunder in, in uprising, right? The, does uprising respond to, is it shaped by emergent or re-emergent forms of, of dispossession? And in, and in that light, how, how far do we need to understand things like the crises of capital within these sort of longer enduring colonial histories. Um, so be before I get to um, the format, I just wanna plug the other year long series we have at the Kevorkian Center, which is called Digital Forays. And Digital Forays is essentially a series about what it means to think, to act, to be in our digital present. Um, and the next event we have on December 3rd, I believe is an event in that series. It is called, let me get this right. It's called Rewind, Repeat, Rehash, History, Materiality, and Digital Colonialism. So exciting title, if nothing else. Um, I'd, I'd like to also thank our colleagues at the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies as well as NYU's International Education Week for their very generous co-support and sponsorship. We're very, very grateful. So the format will be as we've always done it, but there's gonna be a slight adjustment today. Sadly, Manu Goswami is not uh, able to be with us today. Um, we're still gonna have uh, sort of 10 minute interventions by our panelists, 10 or so minutes. Uh, and then we will um, move, a little bit quicker to open it up to a general Q&A. We'll see if our panelists want to respond to each other's interventions, but we will generally move quicker to, to the Q&A. And I want to encourage everyone to, to pitch in. I mean, you can begin pitching in before the interventions are finished. You can wait till they're finished. And I just want to remind everyone that there are a couple of ways you can ask a question or pose a comment. You can use the raise hand function in Zoom itself. Or you can use the chat box, right? You can you, you can send that question out to everyone, and we will either our panelists will respond to them, or we will re relay them to our panelists. Or if you want to ask a question privately, you can private message um, any any one of us, um, and and we will get to it. Um, the other thing uh, I wanted to just mention is that this event will be recorded. It will be up on our YouTube page very shortly. Um, just so that everyone's on the same page there. So today we have uh, a set of three quite brilliant thinkers and activists um, that I have really taken and learned so much from across the years, whose work I continue to go back to, I continue to teach regularly, and it is a real honor and pleasure to have them with us today, and I am immensely grateful that they have all agreed to be here.
um, and I'm just going to introduce them very briefly in um, alphabetical order and in the order of their appearance, and then I'm going to hand it over and we can we can get right into it. Um, so Brenna Bandar is a senior lecturer at the School of Law at the, at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. She's the author of Colonial Lives of Property, Law, Land, and Racial Regimes of Ownership. Julia Eliashar is Associate Professor of Anthropology and uh, the, at the Princeton Institute of International and Regional Studies at Princeton University. She's the author of Markets of Dispossession, NGOs, Economy Development, and the States. And Shireen Saikali is Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the author of Men of Capital, Scarcity and Economy in Mandate Palestine. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Brenna. Brenna, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Nasser. Uh, I'd first like to just acknowledge that I'm currently residing on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen First Nation, whose historic relationships to the land continue into the present day. Um, and I'd like to thank Nasser and James and Jared for the invitation. It's a real honor to be in conversation uh, with Shireen and Julia and others. And um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just speak for about 10 minutes now and uh, I'll just jump right in. Unfortunately, I don't have any images to show you. Um, the prompt for this conversation includes a number of questions that constitute hugely rich research trajectories in and of themselves. The relationship between financialization and extractive industries, the epistemological and perhaps even ontological presuppositions that accompany the conceptualization of dispossession. Here I'm thinking of uh, recent work by Robert Nichols. The relationship between sustained revolt and claims to land and modes of colonial appropriation and settlement that continue to structure contemporary political and economic relations. In these initial remarks, I want to suggest that in the current moment, the place of land and space as real estate is central to a highly financialized global economy and that the increasing prominence of financialized economic relations in the sphere of housing in particular is a vital framework through which to analyze and understand the types of subordination and capture that people are resisting and rejecting. To be more specific, we can think through a few of the dramatic shifts in subjectivity and governance that financialization invites or even requires and what this means for something as essential as shelter. Along with the possessive individual of liberal philosophy, a foundational figure in the racial regimes of ownership that characterize settler colonialisms throughout the world, there are the emergent technologies of financialization that have required different legal architectures, a different settlement between state and capital, different ways of being in the world. Ever since David Harvey's analysis of the spatial fix that is required by surplus capital to literally ground itself and create new frontiers, it has become clear that this form of capitalist accumulation is one of the most powerful forces shaping urban space today. The nexus between state and finance in the realm of the lived built environment, a phrase I borrow from Helen Kazan, shape and reshape financial markets, the urban built environment and the state apparatus itself. On the one hand, these transformations in real estate markets have reshaped racial regimes of ownership in urban spaces by exploiting communities who were historically locked out of ownership through the use of debt instruments that extract value across monetary, psychic, and biopolitical registers. On the other hand, it is also clear that property logics and ideologies of ownership have always been central to both the racialization of people as owners or non-owners, and mechanisms of displacement and dispossession. The use of indebtedness and the mortgage instrument specifically, and here I'm thinking of the work of K. Sue Park, uh, 
to accumulate wealth for some at the expense of other people's lives has always been a global story and has always had embedded within it the racial sensibility of the frontier, despite the wildly complicated nature of contemporary algorithmic investment practices. So turning to think about financialization specifically, um, I want to quote from the work of Kostas Lepovitsas uh, when he, he points to the difference between how we might understand the rise of finance capital in an earlier period um, and now financialization. So quoting from Lepovitsas, he says, it's hard to exaggerate what an extraordinary fact this is that the catalyst of 2007-8 was speculative mortgage lending to the poorest workers. In the 19th century, it was impossible to imagine global disruption of accumulation that materialized because of debts incurred by the workers, individuals, the poorest, end quote. So whereas finance capital can be understood in Marx's terms of fictitious capital, in that historically it was based on, and here I'm quoting again from Lepovitsas, associating the supply of investment credit with the formation of fixed capital by industrial enterprises, end quote. Financialization is more about the circulation and use of loanable capital than fictitious capital. So the innovation, I'm sorry, I'm just marking what, I'm, what I mean by financialization and I, I, it's very obviously very basic, but the innovation that financialization introduces into the speculative regime of accumulation is to create a form of profit that can be unrelated to the creation of surplus value. So the underlying asset might bottom out or be liquidated, but profit has been generated on the exchange of the finan financialized asset, which is exactly what we saw with the subprime mortgage crisis. So some of the key traits of financialization that mark it out as a distinctive phenomenon are the following. It requires the transformation of the conduct of non-financial enterprises, banks, and households, which constitute the basis of financialization. It heralds a different kind of bordering. Here I'm quoting from Lapavitsas again, quote, a different kind of bordering and territorialization. It is not tied to exclusive trading zones associated with territorial empires, but financial relations proliferating in the economic life and of workers and households in general, end quote. Now Raquel Rolnick has analyzed the financialization of housing on a fairly global scale and has made the following observations. So whereas Lapavitsas is analyzing financialization um, sort of in, in, in a more abstract sense, uh, the work of someone like Raquel Rolnick amongst others have, have looked at financialization specifically as it relates to housing. And, she has found, she has made the following observations. So the abstract speculative finance has a deterritorializing effect. So echoing um, Lapavitsas, producing homogenous rent seeking landscapes, which then come to have a separate existence in the realm of finance as homogenous real estate products that can be priced in international markets. This reflects the takeover of the, of the built space by financial capital which is accomplished through housing and urban policy. This has been a global process aided by development models created by institutions like the World Bank and that on the individual level, and this is really what I want us to keep in the forefront of our minds, this means that the only way to get housing is to become indebted and to avail oneself of credit. So there's an em emphasis on an ideology of ownership but also the ability to use a house or, or an apartment or, or your residence as collateral for cash for family members. Um, and this is also, of course, um, picked up in, in Piketty's work. Um, now, as Rolnick observes, providing an overview of what she terms a globalized urban warfare, that's her term, the ideology of home ownership and housing financialization have transformed the home um, from a social good into a financial asset. So how do we understand, and this is, I guess, my primary question, how do we understand the relationship between abstract models of financialized real estate investment and the social and embodied realities 
of living within contemporary markets and land. At what point does the violence of the abstract financial models of real estate development confront real lived social situations? And how do forms of resistance, resistance to eviction, to bad housing conditions, to homelessness, confront the abstractions of financialization? And um, the, <laughs> Uh, you know, one, one event that's really prompted my turn to research in this area was the Grenfell Tower fire, which happened just over three years ago, which I'll, I'll refer to now as I move towards a conclusion. Um, the pandemic has brought much of this into stark relief. The hugely disproportionate number of black and brown people who have fallen ill and died from COVID-19 has been linked to systemic racism across the housing sector. Uh, it's been linked to the types of frontline and precarious work that many brown and black people do. And of course, the systemic racism in, the health, in health provision itself. Through the spring and summer, the mass uprisings that happened globally heralded a call for racial justice. This happened during the pandemic where locking down, sheltering in, staying in place, were identified by the state as the primary means of avoiding illness and potentially death. As others have observed, these injunctions revealed how structural and historically embedded inequities in housing intensified by waves of predatory gentrification and displacement that are absolutely key to financialized real estate markets were implicated in the higher rates of illness and death amongst poor and racialized communities. So I want to suggest that the revolts that we saw, at least in the UK, uh, were in part a literal outburst against this constellation. The statement, I can't breathe, took on a very particular meaning in the months of June and July, the third anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire. Racist police violence, a potentially lethal airborne virus, and a fatal fire that led to the deaths of 72 people three years ago, different forms of organized state abandonment reflect different kinds of dispossession that co coexist alongside each other, each with particular histories that are also entwined with one another. These uprisings born out of the long, slow violence occasioned by organized state abandonment, to borrow a term from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, can be understood to paraphrase, to paraphrase Miranda Joseph as, and I quote, concrete particularities, the products and bearers of abstract social processes and relations, socially effective, generative, real abstractions, end quote. The notion of real abstraction may be one way of framing current struggles over land, housing and survival and understanding a world where dispossession is not any longer simply rooted in exclusion from an ontology of the possessive individual, but where dispossession of our time and of our embodied everyday lives through economies and of credit and debt have become seemingly inescapable. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Rena. Thank you so much. Uh, Julia, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm muting. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I am first want to just give thanks also to James and to Nasser and to Jared for inviting me to be part of this event and to Brenna and Shanine for thinking together with me and to everyone in the room. I'm actually going to um, do a screen share in my endless quest to uh, not be living on the Zoom square. Uh, so one second, if you'll give me a moment. I'm going to share my screen, and then there we go. Um, okay, one second. Tell me, good, we're all right here? Fine, so there's my name, and what matters here is the second line. Um, 
My, I am here today as an assistant professor faculty fellow of the Kevorkian Center for New Eastern Studies uh, at uh, NYU from 2001 to 2004. And I'll begin um, talking from there. And so writing some thoughts down for this uh, Zoom event today, memories of the physical place cut in. I often walked on these lands of the Lenape people since I was a girl, but first entered the Kevorkian building to give a talk for a postdoc 20 years ago now, just off a plane from Ljubljana, baby in tow, no talk written, and a bad case of laryngitis. Those streets still resembled the places where I would have lunch with my father, make music with friends, and play rents, rent so cheap. That day at Kevorkian, I lost my voice while speaking, got distracted by my baby crying, but somehow started work in 2001, the week of September 11th. Giuliani was mayor, the firehouse around the corner right there, uh, where my son loved to climb up on the trucks, became Giuliani's staging grounds for what was to come. We went to demonstrations in Washington Square. I couldn't find the Washington Square demonstration, so we have that. For that attack, that war, that year, and in other places in the years before and the years after. But here in this virtual Kivo space, as we now call it in 2020, what to say about primitive accumulation. I first read Marks on Accumulation in one of those New York City spaces long gone, taught by Mary Bulger at the New York Marxist School, then the Brecht Forum, moving around New York City as the rents got higher. We can all go back and surely do uh, to Marx's famous chapter on, on primitive accumulation or originary accumulation in volume one of Capital. And we can note with Rosen Luxemburg and others that primitive accumulation is an ongoing event. All of us in this Zoom room have done this kind of work in different ways. Mulling, mulling, uh, excuse me. Yeah, so as I was thinking over what to do with all of this, a tweet appeared on my uh, Twitter timeline uh, from Professor Rob, uh, Robbie Richardson, of the Mi'kmaq scholar of 18th century English literature, whose book, The Savage and the Modern Self, is a must read. Richardson's tweet said, and I, um, this is his book, which again, I encourage everyone to read, and this was the tweet. Uh, it said, um, one of the amazing features of the Marx Memorial Library in London is this mural, the worker of the future clearing away the chaos of capitalism. It was painted in 1934 by Jack Hastings, the 16th Earl of Huntington, AKA the Red Earl. He studied under Diego Rivera. So this painting of the Earl of Hastings and his words on the chaos of capitalism made me think of another Earl one writing before the concept of capitalism came to be. And here I turn to some thoughts from a course I'm teaching right now with Tomasz Masnak and the book we're working on called Alternative Economies Before and After Growth. And here I want to suggest that we can unpack not only primitive accumulation and its link to the colony, but also to unpack accumulation itself. And I'm turning to a notion now to, of uh, accumulation itself as a scourge. And this language, of course, brings to mind first the language of the plague, and the language of the pandemic. But the phrase accumulation of, as a scourge is from James Maitland, the Earl of Lauderdale, another Red Earl. He was called revolutionary in his time because he was sympathetic to the goals of the, Red, of the French Revolution. This too was a time of mass revolt. Lauderdale gives us another way to think beyond the chaos of capitalism by reminding us that endless accumulation was not always a given, not even in the history or histories as I've come to think of it of political economy, and thus that it is not a given in worlds to come either. James Maitland was born in 1759 and died in 1839. He was keeper of the great seal of Scotland and a representative peer for Scotland in the House of Lords. He published a book in 1804 with the title, An Inquiry into the Nature and Origin of Public Wealth and into the Means and Causes of its Increase. Lauderdale uses that phrase, the wealth of nations from Adam Smith, of course. And he brings in and turns it, inverts it with a concept that we can think with usefully today, I think, that of public economy. Mm -hmm. 
Here he brings in one of the central terms of the French Revolution, the public, and joins it together with the notion of wealth or goods. Now we all know that the public of the French Revolution is a troubled one. Others in this room know better, know this part of the story far better than I. And those of you who read the suggested piece on Marx and Algier will have other tools with which to take this all apart. But for now, I just want to note that Lauderdale was a Republican, not in the sense of Trump or of the Republican Party, but in the sense of working for what the Scotsman considered the common good, for that which we have in common. The public needs a public economy, not an individualist economy. Public economy is the economy that serves the public good. One of the revolutionary ideas of the French Revolution that, as we all know, must be decolonized as well. Having money does not mean having wealth, Lauderdale noted. And here, of course, I'm, I'm already thinking with Brenna and what she was presenting before about housing and houses and what is wealth and what we can use and what, what becomes financialized individual wealth. But he then sets out the difference and indeed the contradiction between an increase of public wealth on the one hand and of individual riches on the other. And this is what uh, some call the Lauderdale paradox. Private riches and public wealth are an inverse correlation. We can think about whether this is also true about public economy and financialization. Lauderdale also introduces a distinction, by the way, between what he calls exchangeable value versus use value that would become so important in Marx. Now, Lauderdale is quite marginal to the history of political economy, but he's been coming back through debates on ecological economics and the degrowth movement. Just some images out there in the degrowth world now. Um, and uh, Lauderdale and degrowth must be read while keeping in mind the colonizing Janist face of the liberal French Revolution. But for me today and this semester with um, our students, I wanna think about this multiplicity of threads from neglected strands of political economy that open up ways to consider futures to come. Now, as we know, for, Adam, for those of you, anyway, those of you who are political economy geeks, so for Adam Smith, there was no limit to potential growth. Discovery of the division of labor and the mystery of productive labor solved for him originary dilemmas of what was still called a Christian, Christian economy with the OE. Um, for Marx too, there was no objective limit to the potential growth of productive forces once social possibilities of the means of production were taken out of private hands. But for Lauderdale, this approach contains a delusion. Left unbound, increases in capital and capital accumulation decrease public wealth. There must be due limits to the growth of capital. Lauderdale condemns what he calls bail, that baleful passion for accumulation. And it was this phrase that when I first read it grabbed me. Uh, this is very charged language in the Enlightenment. To speak of a baleful passion for accumulation is to take accumulation away from the sphere of interests where it had laid. Accumulation is irrational here. It, irrationality is lying with he who endlessly accumulates, not with the so-called primitive who are were seen by early anthropologists as irrational, and not what Richardson's studies of the savage and the modern self in his studies of 18th century English literature. Rather, it's those who accumulate without bounds who are irrational, and they are, in fact, in Lauderdale's language of those revolutionary times to which he was so sympathetic, public enemies. So from here, how do we imagine a world after growth, a world after accumulation? When I gave a talk at Rice University in 2014 called Before and After Growth, this was still a pretty marginal topic. But boom, by now it's everywhere. It's clear to many beyond communities of indigenous scholars who've been making this point for so long that accumulation and growth without end are in themselves violent cosmologies. But endless accumulation was not always a given, not even in debates in the core of Great Britain inside what used to be called uh, the metropolitan core. And here it helps to revisit, I think, political economy as an arena, an arena of battles of ideas that were open and hotly contested. 
an arena that contained voices and views of which we still know all too little. Many of those voices disappeared from view in the canon of political economy, even voices writing in England, Scotland, and France. These battles shaped the terms on which originary accumulation was formed. These battles laid the groundwork for theories of colonization as a solution to dilemmas of what Ricardo feared as an un, un, uh, of an impending stationary state. For the stationary state, Ricardo thought, would emerge when less productive land on the constrained British Isles would be brought under cultivation and rent would be produced. And to gesture to a whole other geeky train of thought in history of political thought, but what matters for us and for the, some in the decades to come, colonization became the answer within political economy to solve this dilemma of the stationary state. And this is one reason why the work of returning to names and themes of those left out is crucial. So finally, as I close on this day and this year and this decade of revolt and resistance and the wars that we all fear in this year and years to come, it is hard to think of dispossession in the ways that we did, at least I did, in 1990s and when I was sitting in my offices in Kivo trying to turn my dissertation into a book. Can all this be summed up as neoliberalism as I might have once? Here we have some other mappings of the land on which we stand, which you know some of you will know, um, not the land that I'm standing here, but what, different images of um, Washington Square, the Minata Brook, and uh, Black Friedman, and the mapping grid of 1865. But today, I think about our students and the class just this week students, undergrads from all kinds of fields, academic fields from economics, anthropology, chemistry, and engineering, drawn to thinking about limits to growth. And to them, the limits on how we imagine the future in the way that constrained me, at least, in the 1990s, seem further away and more abstract and bizarre than some of the writings of the Earl of Lauderdale in 1804. And the grounds of accumulation have come undone. And that's where I'll end. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. I'm going to pass it over to Shireen now. Hi, everybody. Um, it's such an honor to be here. My old stomping grounds um, at NYU, where I, I actually met Julia um, and where I organized with GSOC. I see a GSOC activist organizer on our uh, on our call today. And um, it's wonderful to be with you all. And I'm so grateful um, for NASA for the invitation. I'm going to try and share my screen. So I'm gonna, we know, we know today that we're folded into a temporal logic of white supremacy, um, white settler supremacy. And I'm gonna speak briefly about the ebb and flow of electoral maps and how the ever-changing COVID map really signals how enmeshed we are in that logic. And I'm gonna turn to some reflections on Palestine to think about the violence of that temporal suspension and, and its relationship to land property and territory. From the year that brought you six months of April, welcome to Tuesday, part three. Actor and producer Amy Dalen tweeted this reflection on November 5. She got 43,000 likes. Dalen had captured a vortex in which time was at once elongated and condensed, rapidly mobile and static. What produced this condition? And what can it tell us about the differentiated experiences of time, land, and dispossession in a settler colony? Four years of the US administration's assaults on daily life, from the celebration of misogyny and sexual assault that marked the campaign in 2015, to the first days of the travel ban on Muslims, through the denigration of people with disabilities, the formal and informal instigation and further institutionalization of homophobia, anti-blackness and white supremacy set the stage for temporal whirlwind. COVID-19 added another layer of time standing still 
a sort of permanent temporary. The virus imposed a rapid tempo at first. By the last week of March, the John Hopkins counter was a constant fixation. I updated the app hourly. How many people had globally contracted the virus? What were the latest numbers of the dead? The weeks dragged on. The numbers skyrocketed. The virus transgressed transgressed borders and boundaries, shaking our understandings of territory and locale. The fantasy that I could follow Bill Murray's lead to mobilize monotonous repetitive time and transcend cynicism rapidly eroded. So if you haven't seen the movie Groundhog Day, turns out there's no thrill in living the same day over and over again. The hourly updates receded to daily check-ins. The numbers of infected and dead no longer marked temporal distinctions. The virus was now something to live with, not to watch, as it produced new maps of US territory. No, no, it's not the one. Yeah. Um, this is a CNN map published on November 17 that tracks the more than 11 million COVID cases in the country. Temporal deviations expressed and fortified multiple reckonings, economic upheaval and plunder, relentless climate catastrophes, and the daily state-sanctioned assassination of Black men and women in the United States. Rolling and overlapping crises laid bare multiple settler imaginaries of land and territory, of time and the future. As election week approached, these imaginings would become national and global preoccupations. It was television in the late 1950s that introduced color-coded electoral maps. And since 2000, the red-blue divide has become cemented in media depictions. Here we see uh, the red-blue maps of 2008 and 2000, again, 2016. Which color would the country turn now? As people in the United States and the world over watched with bated breath, we unwittingly enrolled in an intensive course in political geography. I straddled Twitter, CNN, and of course, Steve Kornacki's sleepless resilience and his signature gap khakis on MSNBC. From large scale national maps to the state by state charts, the United States became more legible its large land masses detailed in our daily fixations. Before this elongated election time loop, my spouse, a more recent settler in the United States, and I always say I'm a Palestinian settler that lives, on, lives and works on uh, confiscated Chumash land. Um, but my spouse was more uh, recently a settler here would, you know, would often ask me questions like, where is this Nebraska approximately? His questions would invariably reveal my weak grasp on US geography. I habitually pulled up maps to remember exact locations. As we began the long days and nights of election day, new maps entered our daily consumption. Um, so we became fixated on maps like these and, and in part because of our shared dread of another four years of the present administration. Um, learning not just about the location of states, but specific counties of blue in seas of red. By the end of the week, we had committed to memory the afterlives of slavery institutionalized in the Electoral College and its formidable grasp on the US map. And here um, on the left, uh, you see a, a, a cartogram, which was proposed by um, 538 which is a hexa map um, where each state has a surface area corresponding to its number of electors. And we were reminded by data visualizer Kerim Draib um, that it was not land but people that voted. And this is actually um, a visualization that moves. I'm sure most of you have seen it. Um, and you know, we could think here about different epistemologies of land and time, especially if the human and the non-human are thought together. 
Maricopa County was a district we spent a good amount of time with. We would later learn that it was the work of organizations like the Rural Utah Project and young activists like Ali Young, who got out the vote of the Navajo Nation and played a crucial role in flipping the state of Arizona. On the early side of the election time loop on November 4, another influencer, as the youth like to call them, with the handle Carolina Kissy tweeted, is it too late to return the Louisiana purchase? I think she got 5,000 likes, so not as much as the first tweet I mentioned. But what was really interesting to me with the thousands of comments on her thread, you know, pleading for inclusion, the blue spots in Louisiana, the blue state of Colorado, but wait, Minnesota had gone blue. Only a handful pointed out that you can't return what was never yours. A palimpsest of maps came into view. It was as if crisis peeled away at the layers of dispossession. Temporal suspension mapped directly on to territorial sovereignty and its lack and indigenous dispossession, as well as the living present of enslavement. Many of the borders and communities on this map in front of you were forcibly displaced time and time again. So even this map, is a result of dispossession, not merely a representation of it. A Palestinian posed another way to see the map, one that included a partition plan, bridges between blue states, and the possibility of moving to democratic and republican states to become part of a quote unquote majority, a two state imposition, if you will. The US maps constantly modulating fortunes were not simply a reminder of political divisions. They calibrate the indigenous present into political vision. Indigenous intellectual Chelsea Vowell teaches us that timelines of catastrophe often center settler temporalities. Indigenous people have already lived through multiple ends. A stark example of this settler temporality was the ubiquitous depiction of the US's 200 year political experiment when federations and representative politics are hundreds of years older on these lands. In the words of the indigenous scholar Kyle White, quote, indigenous peoples already inhabit what our ancestors would have characterized as a dystopian future. So we consider the future from what we believe is already a dystopia, end of quote. Facing a persistently shrinking map is something Palestinians know intimately. This is the angle of vision that informs my work. And it was during the election time loop on November 5 that Israeli forces raised the Palestinian village of Khirbat Hamsa. The personal belongings of 73 people fell to the force of military vehicles. It was the largest forced displacement in more than four years and one of the largest demolitions of the last decade. Bearing the first rain of the year, the villagers searched the wreckage, a bed here, a blanket there, gathering what they could from the shattered intimacies of daily life. Palestine has a lot to teach us about our present condition of the permanent temporary. Unclear what the future holds, suspended in time without an end in sight and uncertain what the normal we will return to will be. For some, this condition of cyclical and ongoing crisis is a rupture. For many throughout the, throughout the United States and globally, and certainly for the Palestinians, it is a way of life. Violence and disp dispossession are not interruptions, but rather markers of the temporal and spatial suspension of the everyday. Here I will end with a few words about the project I'm working on now titled From Baltimore to Beirut on the question of Palestine. The photograph on the right is dated 1916 and there you see an olive skinned young man with a dapper mustache sitting authoritatively on a stool in Sudan. He wears a white suit and a black tie. His back is straight, his legs are crossed, his hands folded on his lap. Two black Sudanese men stand at attention, a discreet distance away. One wears a turban, the other a fez, 
A pith helmet crowns the young man's disposition. It is a racialized symbol of his vulnerability to quote unquote tropical climates and diseases. Behind the three men is the civili civilian hospital where they all work. The seated man, confident in his civilizational superiority, in his civilizational and racial superiority, is Naim Qutran, born in 1877 and died in 1961. Naim was my great grandfather. Some three decades after he posed for this photograph, the British colonial authorities he emulated would be the agents of his subordination and ultimate dispossession. In this image, Naim sits armed with his Western expertise, mediating between the Sudanese people and their colonizers. He inhabits the vanguard of a colonial temporality in which Western civilization advances through conquest. In Sudan, Naim occupied the position of the quote unquote superior doctor, albeit a second tier one, healing the quote unquote backward natives. When he returned to Palestine to establish his private practice in the early 1920s, he faced new formulas. In the League of Nations logic that inaugurated British mandatory rule in Palestine, Naim was now one of the quote unquote backward subjects crawling from a primitive present toward a modern future. Unlike their Lebanese, Syrian, Transjordanian, and Iraqi counterparts, Palestinians under the mandate regime were denied access to representative institutions and developmental infrastructures. The British mandate in Palestine envisioned a future for the land, but not for its people. From the per Permanent Mandates Commission's perspective, these Palestinians kept the country in a state of stagnation. The land needed an able and energetic people to facilitate its arrival to a modern temporality. Naim's future was held in suspension. Palestinians across divides, class divides and other divides struggled for their present and nourished heterogeneous visions for the future, but their possibilities were increasingly foreclosed. Naim, like all Palestinians, was dispossessed and his homeland dismembered. The conditions of presence, of presence absence and temporal abeyance would mark Naim until his death. Scholars usually think of these phenomena as beginning after 1948 with the permanent temporariness of refugee life and the 1948 Israeli emergency regulation that shaped the Palestinian as present on the land but absent in law. When the war between Arabs and Jews began in 1948, and I say those categories um, not as self-evident, obviously, as those that are in construction. Um, but when, when the war started, uh, Naim and his wife, Anisi, born in 1896 and died in 1978, um, struggled to remain in the midst of the Nakba, or catastrophe. Naim maintained his faith in bureaucracy. He was confident. He knew the rules. He understood the importance of evidence. And for four years, he gathered certificates, deeds, and maps for the lands he owned in the village of Nahrad Naba, about eight miles from Acre. These lands, he insisted time and again, were, quote, my private, my private property. He petitioned, he appealed. A formidable wall of bureaucracy excluded him at each turn. Between June and November of 1949, Naim and Anise found their orchards burned, and this is the image you see on the right, dated 1949. Two years later, impoverished and defeated, my great-grandparents joined their family in exile. Time shifted. It became suspended between crisis and stasis. Quote, the matter of time is a very important factor, especially to us refugees, end of quote, Naim explained. He lived in the fractures between immediate emergency and long-term displacement. In exile and in the throes of ongoing catastrophe, he maintained his faith in the rules and his rights to claim them. Quote, I am, a, I am a Palestinian refugee from the city of Acre. I'm an old man. I have a family to support, end of quote. Naim penned these pleas from 1951 until his death a decade later, 
he compiled, labeled, and organized an inventory of failed attempts to secure the return of 660 Israeli liras he had deposited in a bank in Haifa before exile. He petitioned to buy time, to buy a future that was no longer his own. My great-grandfather and the Palestinians from Khirbat Homsa impart lessons on territorial sovereignty and suspended temporality. They teach us that dispossession attempts to vanquish the past, to besiege the present, to foreclose the future. They teach us to stand in place in the face of the permanent temporary, suspension and abeyance, a prolonged and fragmented state of waiting. They teach us to fight for shrinking returns and to plan not for, but against that future of looped crisis, suspension, foreclosure, and dispossession. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shireen. Thank, thank you all for those incredibly rich set of um, interventions and ideas. Um, so at this stage, I, I wanna invite everyone, we're gonna just open the Q&A session, session, Q&A part of this. You can, again, you can type your questions in, or you can use the raise hand um, function. Um, and I, I'm going to give a chance um, to our panelists if they want to respond to each other. I mean, or um, I can begin by maybe maybe thinking of a, a one question that that comes to me um, just to, just while people gather their thoughts and as a way of maybe kicking things off. So there's an in, incredible amount. Um, to think through there, really, and um, I, I, I want to just maybe throw out a question that's not fully formed, um, but that that maybe tries to 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 relate this somehow to praxis, right? Um, and to, to to link all of what you all said to praxis somehow, just just well, just while we wait for people to gather their thoughts, um, and so it's it's the question is about. How, you know, listening to all of you speak, how we might think of um, the type of em emergent praxis that um, that responds to dispossession, right? If um, if dispossession is, as Shireen just told us, not some sort of temporal interruption, but um, this kind of persistent temporality, this eternal heart of accumulation itself, and if it is um, as Brenna told us, um, really about predatory inclusion and really financialization as a, as a form of plunder and uh, masses of people are being moved, or racialized people are being moved from exclusion to this sort of violent predatory inclusion. And if it's as Julia told us, also historically a kind of um, a kind of fix, right, to this to this limit of the stationary state. Uh, what? what how, how do we think? You know, how do we think the question of praxis, right? If it's not, if it's no longer, if it's no longer a question of organized labor and the strike, um, you know, and and we're we're here dealing with the violence of finance and the commodification of land. Um, what responds to that? Like, what, you know, if the question is exploitation and, the, and you know, the, the, the historical context is, you know, um, organized labor, today the question is uh, plunder and extraction and, you know, the, the, the becoming surplus of all kinds of people, right? The becoming surplus of all kinds of racialized people, which as we know, you know, in, 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 after hearing you all talk, it doesn't amount to exclusion per se, right? Um, and in one sense, the you know we can think of the revolts and the uprisings as a as a kind of res, you know re respond to that right. And I'm taken by this sense that you know the, the, the inability to breathe, the I can't breathe, indexes so much more um, uh, in a kind of much more more broader sense, right? Um, but how do we think about um, you know is there is there is there a praxis that gets at the at the limit here that? That that um, that this possession kind of presents. Um, I'm going to throw that out there um, and see if any other questions come in 
see a question from Amir Al Kalai. Amir, can I ask you to unmute yourself? Uh, am I unmuted? You are. You? Yes. Thank you. Those were just uh, stunning presentations, all of them. Um, and I just want to say a couple of comments that came to mind. First of all, um, you know, I think the phrase that has been going through my mind for the last number of years is controlled demolition um, in all senses, controlled demolition. And with that goes demographic destruction, you know, just generational demographic destruction. In other words, generations being faced with, you know, besides all the subcategories that that involves, whole generations being met with an onslaught of diminished horizons, diminished possibilities, and literally fewer people. Um, and this is a, you know, this is changing the face of the world very rapidly. Um, and in light of that, the thing that struck me, particularly in Shireen and Julia's uh, presentations, but also in Brenna's to some extent, the, the, the particularity, the personal, to me, it's something I've been doing for 40 years, you know, in, in academic settings and not always met with, uh, you know, with, with, you know, happiness. Uh, and I, I'm just thrilled to see uh, the power of it, the absolute power of it and how it really does create new knowledge and the possibility of, of, of finding other sources that, that we can extract terminology from and methodology from. So those were my thoughts and thanks. Thank you, Emil. I don't know if Brenna, Shereen, Julia, you wanna to respond to any of that while things come in. I think I wanted to ask um, Shereen and Julia and whoever else, Nasser, you might have, um, I'm sure you do have some thoughts on this as well, but I, I in listening to Shireen um, in particular, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the relationship between this idea of the generational that the gentleman just mentioned in his comment and, and temporality. And so, you know, that one phrase that really stuck with me, Shireen, was this, when you, when you mentioned how time becomes suspended between crisis and stasis, I think. And I was wondering, you know, you were speaking about somewhat your, your great grand, your great great grandfather or your great grandfather, I can't quite recall, but I was wondering what, what that means for subsequent generations, particularly in terms of how displacement and dispossession and um, being a refugee specifically um, is something that is then carried on generationally. But the, the, the relationship between that transmission and the way in which you're conceiving of temporality strikes me as a very you know, complex relationship. And, and so I wanted to ask you or, or, and Julia as well, um, what, what your thoughts might be on, on that. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you all. I, I'll just say um, really quickly to sort of think through, um, I mean, the, the prompt was so rich and I, and I don't think we got to the point about um, resistance and upheaval. And this is something that I think about and live with. Um, it's what sustains me. And it's why I mentioned GSOC because I was so happy to see a, um, GSOC on um, our call and, and my own experience in living the Egyptian revolution really changed me in fundamental ways. Um, I'll say briefly that much of what occupies me in, in part because of the, the separation, um, uh, the apartheid that, um, that Palestinians have been subject to um, 
familial and other kinds of apartness have, have I think instilled in me uh, a, a real desire for togetherness. And one of the things I was trying to think through um, in this, in the first part of this piece was what sorts of togetherness have these crises produced? Um, and I think that there's so much to be thinking through about the, the togetherness of, of mass movements and, um, and that kind of political work that has been ongoing. Um, and you know, hopefully we can talk more about that. Um, Amiel, it's so lovely to see you and thank you for paving the way for us to do um, these kinds of personal <laughs> renditions. Of course, I only had the courage to, to do family history after I had kind of proven my worth <laughs> with another type of book. I don't know that I would have had the courage that you've had from the very beginning. Um, thank you so much, Brenna, for the question about generational um, generational sort of variations of temporality. I guess I would say first that I think I want to pay really close attention to how those experiences are differentiated. And part of the reason I want to do this project is really to think about and um, call out um, class privilege and racial privilege um, that, that, I can't, that I come from, um, the kind of social mobility um, that has made it possible for me to be in this Zoom room, um, that sort of generational privilege. Um, the reason I think that's important it is politically, it's politically important in the present, but it's also, I think, a real responsibility for us to um, reject the logic that um, it is only the colonial that produces our present and, and that we really have a responsibility to um, critique ourselves and, our, and our, our differentiations within our different collectivities. Um, I think there's a lot, the second thing I'll say on a more personal level, so I mean, so the first question is the kind of permanent temporary that a, that a refugee lives in Aina Kelwe is different from my permanent temporary. It was different from Naim's permanent temporary. You know, the, the, the big divide, one of the interesting things that happens with my great grandfather is after he goes to exile in Lebanon, he serves as a doctor in one of the refugee camps in, in, in Lebanon in, in Ain al Helwe, where the villagers where he owned land um, um, had taken refuge. And so I often think about that relationship between them. Um, and, you know, I want to really recognize the, the differentiated um, temporalities that, that they lived and existed in. They shared some things, but they were also deeply marked by um, class and different kinds of mobility, among them racial, right? So this is my plea that we don't see race as something that only happens in North America and Western Europe. Obviously, um, that's another conversation and I don't need to say it to anybody in this room. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that I think there is something, you know, about the way that we carry trauma in our genetic makeup. And I think that my um, sort of accidental realization that my great grandfather had been haunting me for 20 years um, not only has shaken my like committed atheism, but has also um, invited me to think differently about time in nonlinear ways and invited me to think about how I may be um, accompanying him <laughs> in, in ways that I haven't yet understood. Julia, do you want to jump in on that? I don't know. Sure. I want not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. The, um, the, as Shireen was also saying, I mean, the questions are so rich in the opening, so many, it's, it's hard to know um, where to begin to speak or what to say. Um, for one thing, um, I'll use the face of like as an anthropologist or a economic anthropologist or the question of embodied histories and that which is rendered asunder and put back together in different conglomerations and, and mediations is um, so crucial where we're not looking at, you know, this duality um, invites us, at least in that level of theory, some openings 
for how to not think on the one hand of, oh, there's the land that's taken and the people who are, you know, taken away from land, but rather these, and there's there's um, so many scholars who work on this, you know, some of Bashar al-Dumani's work, um, or both of your work in different ways, theoretically and empirically. Amiel, you, you know, I'm seeing you up there on the top. <laughs> Thank you for jumping in here as well. Um, has this multiple layers and there's ways that we can think about a different kind of a violence and a refiguring and coming back together again and the embodiment of collectivities and um, distributed agency over time. Um, and Brenna, I mean, I love the way that you work, you know, with Malibu's work on the, some of these, some of these concepts have been very helpful for me of late trying to think of collectivity and memory over time in a situation that's not the stark duality of the colonizer and the colonized. Um, so that's one thing. And it's one reason why on the one hand, I think we had some stutters in our, um, uh, as you know, Brenna mentioned in the beginning, we decided we talked to each other for a minute as people who read each other and think with each other. But the way to find vocabularies to talk together across um, a shared set of concerns and interests with different disciplinary ways of thinking um, is both so vital and not intuitive. So there's a punctuation of that as well. Um, I'll say that again, just to bring in the personal here, it's a conversation that I've had over many, many years with Amiel and also with um, Shireen more recently um, in terms of family histories and the gradations of privilege and how things get reworked because some of my own work um, in my own family history from Palestine and um, one of the books I'm working on of diaries of a Palestinian Jew, but the process through which someone who's indigenous and local from Palestine, but through the creation of a state as defined as Jewish becomes a member of, or has the potential to become a member of the elite. Um, and it's not, it's, there's a whole reworking of the relation of objects, land of house, a shirt. There's something I wrote about seeing a shirt in a museum and how can you deal, decolonize a shirt, you know, that, that I'm looking at in the story that it tells and tell that story differently is, is part of what happens. So there's a vast um, opening and range of possibilities of mosaics. And, you know, Amelia you're really cutting edge here for so many of us for so long. Um, but I think there's ways for us to do it now. And there's a need to do it now just because of times when the models with which we think and which we were trained, um, it's not that they don't exist, but they're like Shireen's maps. They're, <laughs> they're getting, you know, they're, they're constricting. And so how to describe and talk about and think about what's out there. There's so many, so many stories, so many realities that did not make it into the dominant social science models, at least, you know, the ways that I was trained to think. And that's been a lot of what's concerned me over the past many, many years. I, I just wanted to um, jump in on the tail of this and looking at one of the questions in the chat about um, family histories and memory and, and, and those being a source of knowledge production and theorization. And I think in addition to um, Shireen's motivations for her, for this project that you're, you're working on now in terms of accounting for the class and racial uh, differences, hierarchies, um, you know, within Palestine, and we can think of many other contexts. And I, I always think, actually, as a diasporic South Asian, and then as an outsider to, uh, you know, doing research in Palestine and Israel, that there's so many similarities when it comes to knowledge production in these two places. And, you know, it's really interesting to think about that in relationship to the histories of partition that have been uh, generated. So, I, I think that that motivation is very welcome. Um, um, uh, I think in addition to that, one, one um, another dimension to this, which, which I think is vitally important and also quite nascent in terms of how we might think about this theoretically is that I think when it comes to sort of intergenerational transmission of trauma. I know there's a huge literature on trauma and trauma studies, but um, I think that, that 
you know, and in, in terms of trying to link this to Nasser's initial point on praxis, um, I think there's, you know, a, a need to think about how the transmission of traumatic experience and histories um, shape us in a psychoanalytic sense. So, so in the way that, you know, Shireen, you mentioned my grandfather, great grandfather has been kind of with me or haunting me in ways that I didn't realize, right? So the, the ways in which these um, uh, traumatic histories shape our very psyches in different ways, depending on, you know, uh, where, where we sit, but how that relates to the social is a really important question that, that we see um, being elaborated by Black feminist scholars like Gail Lewis in the UK. Um, you know, she is someone who has, I think, over decades now really worked on the the relate the complex relationship between, um, you know, the psychic life of a racialized working class queer subject and and histories of the state, social welfare provision, etc. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, these sorts of trajectories of research are also a crucial part of thinking about how experiences of particular experiences of the family and the individual relate to, um, 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 you know, contemporary social and economic and political formation. So I just wanted to, to mention that. So as people keep gathering their thoughts, I just want to remind everyone that you can just, like Joanne just did, throw in a question in the chat box at any time. Um, and uh, I just I, I wanted to pick up on that um, that last uh, that last point, maybe, but I'm 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 afraid that this will shift the conversation a little bit further away from the personal and. Um, and the, the kind of methods that you're all using and bringing in. Um, but I was, I was uh, taken by Brenna's uh, sort of synthesis now between that as a sort of a method and a way um, and this question of, of the social. Um, and it reminded me, um, you know, one of the, one of the impulses um, initially for this, uh, for this panel was um was was this sense in some of the in some of the literature that um you know the the kind of revolts around dispossession and um the kind of various forms of action that are happening now are a kind of um demand for sociality right that um and and um Hassan Hajj in the last global uprising series we, um session we had made this point about Lebanon's Lebanon's protests recently, right? And Lebanon is a sort of um, a site of almost uh, paradigmatically frenetic, you know, financialized plunder. And he said, uh, you know, the protests were almost a kind of um, attempt to constitute uh, the absent social, right? That, that um, profit making had become not not a not a structure, but um, that requires any kind of social reproduction, but an event, right? this, this plundering, extractive event. And the demonstrations were kind of attempt to constitute a social. And I'm just listening to the, the kind of, you know, the ways that, that that can be intersected with, you know, queer studies and queer thought and feminism and gender to think of, you know, if, if that, if, if somehow what's at stake now is no longer, um, you know, a, a, a kind of return to a form of social reproduction and welfare and, you know, um, the public, but actually what, what's at stake is not the public, but the social itself. And then the stakes seem a little, a, a little different, a little starker. Um, I don't really have a question there, that's just a comment I'm throwing out. Um, but that, I, I was, I was struck by that. Um, I mean, I think that does raise that the, the 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 question and I think what I was trying to get at in my comments was sort of how do we 
think about the point of confrontation or, or indeed the contact points between the kinds of, you know, in terms of my own interests, financialized abstraction. So, mm -hmm. so thinking about the violence of abstraction, but in its contemporary financialized forms, and, and then how people who are really just trying to survive, um, you know, you know, what does the point of confrontation look like? And so I think, you know, things like there, there are my examples mainly come from the UK at the moment, but, you know, I'm sure there are examples uh, similar. There are similar movements going on in Spain and in, in, in other countries for sure. But, you know, the moment where this very individualized economy of extraction in terms of the individual through debt, right? When, when people come together for a debt jubilee or when people come together for a rent strike, um, you know, there's, it, it's interesting, I guess, in terms of temporality as well, thinking about how something like the rent strike is such an old form of resistance and mm -hmm. it is about a coming together and, and a collective act of refusal. Um, but the different significance that takes on in this contemporary moment where, you know, the rent strike is actually, you know, you're not just striking against a landlord, you're, you're, you're striking against a huge, um, you know, real estate investment trust that, that is, is composed of, you know, much globalized sort of uh, capital, you know, and it's, 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 it's interesting to, 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 to think about the changing, changing significance of well entrenched forms of resistance or revolt and, and what they mean in this, in this moment. Um, and I do think that the, the revolt, you know, that the uprisings that happened in the UK were a response to the lockdown. I mean, you know, it was patently obvious that poor housing and the fact that, you know, racialized communities and working class communities and the way that those two things are laminated onto one another in, in most places, definitely the UK, you know, how, how that had created further vulnerability to illness. And I think just this streaming of thousands of people out onto the street was in part a response to that to that, uh, you know, that that particular manifestation of racial injustice, so racial and class injustice. I, mean, I, I, I just personally, I would say that I, I think, um, you know, something similar happened here, at least in New York in the summer. And, um, it was a, a very broad systemic sort of refusal, I think, of the demonstration. There is um, a question in the chat from Maya Mikdashi that I'm going to read out. And this is amazing because the question earlier was from Joanne Nucho. So it's a kind of, this is a Kivo sort of, um, I don't know, a reunion of, of type. Um, uh, so it's a question that takes us sort of back into settler colonial studies, and I'll just read it out. She says, I would love to hear more about overlapping and incongruous temporalities of dispossession, praxis, resistance, exploitation, and of land, particularly through centering of indigenous hi histories and presence and epistemologies. This also seems like a good time for us to all think about if this world is in a holding position, what do we want to move towards and who does it center? If settler epistemologies center a moment of crisis, catastrophe, are we still imagining a, self a settler future of a post-crisis? Let me take a really quick um, stab at um, Maya's question, and then I want to um, um, think about Brenna's inspiring comments too. Um, I I think this is a time for. I mean, first, let me say, like, I want to push back on how we also, t you know, temporalize resistance. I sort of feel like one of the things I've learned from undergraduates um, at UCSB taking modern Middle East history is them pointing out time and again to me that modern Middle East history is full of resistance, upheaval, organizing, mobilizing, 
movement making from its inception. So I, I feel like we also can, there's space to rethink how that practice is, um, is, is not just reactive, but sort of shaping um, um, the times that we live in and, 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 and our histories. Um, and I think one of the things that's been really indicative for me in this time in, in this period of COVID, you know, the administration on and on the, the stuff I was trying to um, capture in the first part of my talk is talking to people who say, oh, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. And it's like, really? <laughs> I mean, this is actually the moment to, to rethink the normal, right? And to go back to something different. I mean, we were going through this in the prep to, for this talk and sort of talking about the difficulty of being on Zoom together, but then we were also talking about some of the advantages, right? Of not traveling, of being able to be together um, um, for, for short periods of time. And so I think that this is, the, this moment of crisis is more than anything, uh, 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 um, a time to think about how we could otherwise imagine a normal, how we could otherwise build a normal, um, how we could sort of, try, you know, try to exit some of the temporal logics that we are in about, you know, what sorts of futures and presence that, that we reside. Um, so I think that's, that's, that is a very exciting possibility at this time. And I think if we, and I think for me, you know, in the wake of, of um, the, the brutal murder of George Floyd and um, all of the invitations from the national uprising that took place, you know, uh, uh, the the possibilities for actual practice in that moment um, were limited, but I but I but they were also um, it was also an opportunity to build on cumulative work in small spaces like the department that I that I uh, work in right, um, and so I think we have to think of our work in that sort of a, a cum cumulative way um, to think of a different kind of accumulation to look really at all of the experiences that um, that that we can draw from. And I wasn't, you know, I'm a fan of Hassan Hajj, and I wasn't at the last um, a global uprisings talk. But I would say that the social has always been at stake. I mean. This is what the Arabi revolt in <laughs> the late 19th century was calling for, right? And creating and constructing Egypt for the Egyptians. I mean, so I think also we should, I don't know, part of me wants to see and recognize the revolutionaries in Lebanon and their ephemeral and failed attempts um, as more than just a reaction to a paradigmatic financial plunder. I want to be able to see how it is that um, they are producing um, new things. And and I, you know, one of the people, and I'll just um, end with this, is that that really inspired me was an organizer in Sudan named uh, Awadia Mahmoud Koko. Um, who is who is from the Nuba Mountains um, of South Kordofan, and when the when the uprising um, was happening in Sudan, and it's not it's not um, a coincidence that we don't talk about that uprising um, as much as we talk about Lebanon or Egypt, and you know just something as simple as. Um, Pra you know, your question about praxis, which is, you know, she starts a soup kitchen for the protesters um, in, 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 in Khartoum. And there's this amazing sort of set of lessons that she imparted on sustenance because the uprising was happening during Ramadan. Um, and she, you know, saw herself as feeding the, 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 um, the lions, as she called them. Um, but I thought that well, one of the other things that her example provides us is that um, 
not like not only was what was taking place an experiment in togetherness and a, and a co-living um, that interrupts root, routinized experiences of time and space, but that also what they were crafting together was a sort of public intimacy. Um, and, and, and that, you know, one of the interesting things that she was doing in, in this corporal sort of uh, labor um, was providing part of what the rebels were demanding, food. So there's just this kind of way that I think the, pract the praxis is, is, is everywhere for us to see um, and, 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 and to recognize and to learn from. Okay, um, well, we're almost at time. If, if anyone, you know, if there's nothing left to add, um, for now we will um, end the sort of formal part of um, the the event, and um, people can still hang around. And there are about fifty people still in in with us. So, if people want to hang around and just talk. Um, we can do that. We can go to we can go to breakout rooms if Jim, who is the breakout room master, thinks it's um, feasible and desirable. Um, but if there, you know, if, um, any any last comments, please jump in. Otherwise, um, just to end the the kind of formal part of things, um, I want to thank the three of you again for these wonderful wonderful interventions. Um, and I want to thank our partners uh, and co-sponsors at the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies and NYU's International Education Week again. Um, I also want to point out that the, the next Global Uprising event on December 8th is sort of paired with this one. It's about corruption and um, finance a little bit more explicitly. Um, and yeah, thank you all. Um, I hope you all stay with us. Um, Jim is going to end the recording now.